people oh yes Live. how does it feel to be dropping your drumstick in front of an audience of one mm. well um, I don't blush easily <laughs> I hope that's true because the cameras don't lie and we got a one right on your face really I, close I caught the drumstick <laughs> I didn't drop a beat Queen Kong welcome to 918 Bathurst the block winner music series pleasure to have you guys here uh, tell me about what you're playing. Well, this piece is called East Third and C, and I wrote it while I was doing a mentorship program in New York uh, with Frank London, and that's where he lives. He lives in East Third and C, 
Um, so I went to New York twice to study with him, once to just kind of get a feel for his methods and watch him and talk about music. And then I went home for five or six weeks, wrote a bunch of tunes, and I went back. And this was one of the one of the pieces that came out of that project. This was recently, like during the pandemic, you went down to New York. Yes. <laughs> and what was? Tell me about that. What was that? What was that like? Like, was it? Was it? What was the vibe down there like? Well, I went in two different parts of the year. So October was pretty much like it was in Toronto. Everyone was kind of easing up, feeling good, going out. Uh, but the next time I went, it was January. So. Uh, people were a lot more cautious, a lot more masky, and my my purpose in New York was not to do any touristy stuff. I wasn't on Broadway. I just went to study with Frank, and I was in his apartment the whole time, except for a couple of rehearsals. Um, Which, in a way, is kind of a little bit of a touristy thing, because Frank London is like the, is like the klezmer icon in North America, probably the world. Like, what what was it like to to sort of be a guest in his living room? Uh, well, I mean, I've known Frank for about 20 years. Um, that's not like a brag. He's just, he's just an easygoing, really cool guy. He, you know, he's just like, no, he's not like you and me. Uh, <laughs> he's way cooler than you are. He's, uh, you know, he, I met him when I was 19, and uh, we became friends almost immediately, and, and me and my boyfriend at the time were invited to get into the car with him, and he drove me to Brooklyn to do a, uh, no, uh, sorry, the Knitting Factory, uh, for a Hasidic New Wave performance. He was just so friendly. He just, And then like, I know his wife, and I know his kids. And we've all been going to Clubs Canada together for 20 years. And so it, it wasn't... Uh, I mean, I, I know the guy... We, like, we've known each other for a really long time, and he's watched me grow up in a way. And so he was the natural choice to go and study with. Uh, well, what was different about this time? Like, you guys have known each other for so long, and now you're here like specifically going with the intent of learning music from him? Was there something that, that he showed you or taught you or, or a direction that he guided you in that helped with, uh, with Queen Kong's music? Well, to be fair, he's been guiding me all along. He's been guiding me for 20 years. I've always looked to him as an inspiration for what happens next in Klezmer, what to do, reharmonizations, arrangements, you know, how to take everything a step further. Uh, and so luckily, uh, thanks to uh, a really fantastic uh, opportunity that came up through Canada Council, I got a mentorship grant. So I was able to uh, fly out to New York um, and, and uh, you know, experience firsthand his, his method, his, you know, he, he introduced me to some of his New York musician friends. He showed me, we sat down and he taught me a whole bunch of harmony that he likes to use to get out of the box and, and just like being there, like he just like runs back and forth to the piano all the time. He's always got a horn in his face and he's either like playing trumpet or cooking and he's mm -hmm. awesome at both of them. So, you know, he'd, he'd cook for me too and his wife would come home and we'd all chat and, and it was a very New York experience in that way because I got to be part of a New York family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like a second family now. We're, we're very close and um, no, I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity for sure. Uh, why don't you guys play us something that's like very Frank London-y? Okay, this is a piece I wrote in 2019. It's one of the first pieces I wrote for Queen Kong. It's called If Then. Mm. And hmm, it was a uh, it was one of the first pieces I wrote to experiment with uh, klezmer modes and sensibilities in a in a kind of a jazz idiom in a and an odd time meter. So it was really fun to write. So this is called If Then. Oh, oh, oh. 
a little bit about your band name. I'm usually like not such a fan of asking bands about, or interviewers asking about the band name, but I will kind of point out that as long as I've known you, you've always had a really sort of good sense of humor and also, you know, a mind that's attuned to like political subtlety. So I want to give you a chance to tell people about about that, and it's it's kind of nicely wrapped up in the band name. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, I knew I wanted the band to be called Queen something, and uh, Queen Kong was a contender. And uh, I was talking to David Bookbinder actually once, and we, you know, he just immediately like rattled off about forty names because he's really clever that way. And uh, this was one of them, so I knew, you know, okay, well, you know, two people thought of it. Okay, Queen Kong it is. And uh, it was it was weird choosing a name like Queen Kong because uh, I play music that reflects uh, klezmer, uh, Yiddish heritage, Jewish culture, and it, it doesn't sound like that from the name. Uh, but that also opened it up for me to like, maybe not necessarily always play klezmer and not necessarily always play Yiddish music. So that's why I kind of stuck with it. And it's... Uh, I wanted it to have a strong feminine uh, image, uh, the queen part, you know, and uh, I knew that I, you know, as it's, there needed to be something to point to uh, the work that I was doing towards it, the writing I was doing, the organizing it, and in a way I'm like, kind of like a queen bee, like putting everything together and stuff, and, but you know, any sort of queen is only as good as like the pe uh, sorry <laughs> that came out totally wrong i i don't feel like a queen i don't act like a queen i i'm certainly i don't think i do maybe the boys can tell you different but uh i i can't do this stuff without them they're they're amazing they we workshop all our tunes together we make a lot of decisions together um, no but i get the vibe of like you know being at the you know the center of your world and sort of um creating a name that reflects the empowerment that you want to send out. Mm -hmm. So, and I also know you've been really vocal about um, certain challenges uh, that you've experienced as a female band leader or as a female musician in the scene. What's that sort of been like? Well, I've been thinking about that a lot and how to, um, how to approach it. And my new kind of go-to is to not approach it uh, at all because um, it's, it doesn't really do anybody good to focus on what someone may or may not be doing to you. And, and despite, um, and I, I honestly, no one's ever walked up to me and told me they're not hiring me because I'm a woman or whatever. Like, I, I don't actually have any actual proof of that. Uh, so uh, I decided just like, if I wanted to do something, I would just do it. I wouldn't wait for anybody else to include me or ask me or... Uh, I was just gonna start my own band and write my own music and play whatever I wanted and and I did that So, you know, I, I just made a place for myself and that's been the best thing I don't dwell on what someone may or may not be doing to me. It, it's it's not productive and I, I just want to play music and not think about Anything like that anymore. I'm in a different place now. It's been amazingly freeing and rewarding and there's never been a moment where I've regretted doing this. I always said to myself, okay, I'll, I'll play music until it's not fun anymore, and that hasn't happened, and, like, the opposite is true. Like, if I, if I hadn't been playing music, like, what the hell would I be doing <laughs> during this pandemic? I'd be, like, I don't know. I, this has been, like, a lifesaver. This has been, like, my joy. So I'm, I'm lucky that up to now I've been seeing it through. Yeah. Well, let's hear it. Some life-saving free music from Queen Kong. This song is called Die Zunwetter Runtigain. I didn't write this one. This is a, uh, this is a, the text is by Emily Halpern. I arranged the melody and, and the, all the parts. And I'm going to sing and play drums. <laughs> Thank 
Hinsen vält är tugen Hinter en man Vält kommande golden Pavel Not a lot of uh, drummers that can lead a band on vocals. I have to take your word for it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty unusual. Like, I wouldn't say impossible. There's, um, you know, we've had this conversation before offline about like you have this dream to have a festival or a series of only drummer-led bands. Mm -hmm. Tell, like, tell me more about that. Who are some of your favorite drummer-led bands, and what do you think? What do you think that drummer leaders bring to a project that is different than, say, violin player leaders? See, that's the thing, I don't know. And that's why I would have a big thing, like a big symposium, because I would love to find out what other drummers do uh, differently, how they think about the band, how they lead from the band, uh, sorry, from the, from the drum set. This I'd be very, very curious. Like you know, uh, one of my favorite drummer Toronto drummer-led bands is Ernesto Servini. He runs mm -hmm. Turbo Prop, and that band kicks ass. I think we all know that. So I, you know, there's you know Larnell Lewis, there's Mark Kelso, there's Alini Morales, there's Ocan, of course, and you know I, it would be really fun to have like just this kind of format where they play a few songs and they talk about how they approach things. I think that'd be a really cool. I would watch that. Well, what do you think, like Max, what's different about being in a band that's led by a drummer than by, uh, you know, somebody else, than a melodic or harmonic player? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I think a lot of the time, there's a lot of freedom in this band for us to all figure out what makes the most sense to us. Mm. And I've played in bands before where it's being led by a chord player or a melody player who has a very specific idea of every single thing about the song before it even gets to the band. Mm -hmm. And something that I really like about working with Laurie in this, in this setting is that it's like, here's the skeleton, 
and what makes the most sense on your instrument and for your personality and in the context of what everybody else is doing. There's a little bit more, I mean, it, it, it's hard to tell if that's like a drummer thing or a Lori thing, honestly, but that's something that I really enjoy about it. Let's hear one more. All right, so we have a song called Moshi. Moshi is the name of Frank London's cat. Um, and I think I tried to get a little bit of that catness in it. And it's also based on, so it's, it's got two big influences. I studied a lot of Santorian music, particularly the bata. So I always wanted to write a, a song based on the bata patterns. So this one's called Inlay. And it also goes into a, a bulgur beat. Maybe I'm explaining the song too much, I don't know. Uh, it's going to feature everybody in the band, so uh, enjoy. Meow. Mm-hmm. 